Well, good, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's very nice to be at my second VLUX conference. And uh, I went to the first to, to, to Rotterdam, which I enjoyed very much, in a building that was, in a way, not so dissimilar from this, in that it was converted from a functional factory. Um, right, designing for access to nature has some tenuous but really very strong connections with daylight, and it's all about the information that daylight brings with it. When I tried to explain, I have to tell you this, when I tried to explain what this presentation was about to my wife, she said, that's obvious, isn't it? And I then tried to explain, to defend myself, and say, well, many obvious things often get rather neglected. I won't tell you what she said after that. Uh, but um, <laughs> So I, I, I think we do uh, assume that whenever we see a green space in in cities, we think that this is accessible, we think that it is fulfilling functions, but we haven't ever actually thought of developing some kind of assessment or metric whereby we can see if it is working. So um, I, this is a very preliminary modest attempt to try and uh, develop some way of assessing how successful uh, access to nature is. First of all, though, um, it, 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 it struck me that we do need to at least justify this effort. And it sort of tends to be taken for granted that access to nature is a good thing. But what is the hard evidence? Well, I was pleasantly surprised to find out there's an enormous amount of hard evidence. But it tends to be always in the situations where it is to correct deprivation from nature rather than simply to rather as cure rather than prevention. So there are many, many studies. Uh, just one of them alone, just to quote one, is the, the, the uh, effect of education. And the, there's in Britain, at least, and I think on the continent, there's a great deal of interest now in educating children from a very young age actually in nature, not just with access to films and, uh, and, and sort of tame nature in the classroom, but actually taking them out into the, into the woodlands and, and, and educating them. And all sorts of um, uh, claims are made, um, not, not, I don't think just claims, but evidence is presented to actually show what impact this has on, on, on children's education. I think it's just to, to go back to the, one, the quote on the left, uh, I see various, sometimes it's 90, sometimes it's 95% of time indoors, but certainly 20 generations ago, it would have probably been the reverse for most of us, or rather most of our predecessors, in terms of our genes. And it, it is interesting that uh, in, I think, 1987, Wilson uh, pr tried to provide an explanation for why are we our perpetual fascination for nature. And that is, of course, that when we... When, our, um, when the factors that affected our survival were very different, we weren't working in air-conditioned offices and factories, um, observing both um, the flora and fauna and the climate was absolutely essential to our survival. And so it is very deeply embedded in us. We may have adapted culturally and behaviorally to living indoors, but our emotions are still firmly rooted outside. So, there seems to be both practical and, um, and sort of theoretical basis for saying, yes, nature is, is very important to us. Um, now, just to justify my being here, um, daylight and, and, and nature, um, there are very interesting, I was directed to a very interesting thesis by Hellinger, who uh, looked at um, daylight and view and uh, reviewed many papers and... Uh, in her review, uh, she quoted various, or I've, I've analysed there, the key issues that emerged, uh, 50 papers. So there's an enormous amount of work being done on this. Um, Highly value of natural um, uh, views. People all agreed that they were valuable. Certainly estate agents agree they're valuable. If you try and buy a house, and the first thing you'll do, the estate agent will do is go to the window and say, what a wonderful view, often even if it isn't. Um, but all of these other claims about health, and I'm going to, well, there's the more rapid recovery of patients after surgery, this classic uh, paper by Ulrich, which is much quoted, but uh, one would thought would have spurred a lot of extra work on this, but it still sort of needs to be done. But I'm going to go down to the bottom point that daylight is more highly valued as an illumination when associated with a view of nature. 
And I think that just for yourself, go to an art gallery with a very sophisticated, daylight, engineered illumination system and look up at it and say, how do I know that's daylight? Uh, I'm not sure you do, because it's usually been so well engineered and, and with, with um, modulation that it's very difficult to tell. And I think that our association with the value of daylight is very much related to the information it carries about where it comes from, and of course where it comes from is the world outside. I do remember going to, in University of Brisbane to see a carbon, uh, sorry, a fibre optic um, daylighting system driven by heliostat on the roof, and we went into this very boring room and looked at some luminaires, and we were meant to be impressed by this wonderful daylight system. It was just like any other lighting system. So it is very essential, I think, that the daylight carries information about its origin. And uh, the bottom two pictures refer to a study that we did at Cambridge. And the left-hand picture shows somebody in what technically and sort of photometrically would be regarded as very bad lighting conditions, with a lot of glare and, and distractions. And yet that kind of lighting was, uh, that kind of daylighting was uh, routinely preferred over the, what you might say, perfectly shaded, perfectly diffused daylight. And this is probably because that person could look up and watch the ducks swimming down the River Cam. Right, so what I've tried to do here, this is the... Um, so, so I think the reason for doing this is to say, well, we tend to take it for granted but is there any way of actually being a little bit more systematic about it? As soon as we're systematic about it and we, we sort of agree this, this structure, then we know perhaps how to focus the efforts of our design. So what, what is proposed here that is that we see, um, sorry, we see the, um, the problem as moving from it really these three zones. So we've... we've uh, I, I, I define these three zones, and this is very much after the work of, of Chalfont, who is an architect and also um, a specialist architect specialising in work for um, uh, uh, dementia patients. And he identified the importance of the relationship between inside and the edge and the, the, near, and the garden. And I've simply added far. So, so much of this idea has originated from his assessment method, although he didn't, again, develop into a formal uh, um, uh, assessment method. So these zones then are linked uh, by, by links, which are either sensory, that is nearly always for us vision, but for some people might consist only of auditory or olfactory uh, communication, and also physical access, which is actually getting to it to be amongst the... Um, amongst the, uh, uh, the area which has nature content itself. Uh, this is sort of vaguely illustrating what we're putting some substance to this. Uh, and, and, and clearly this is a very fortunate person uh, where their inside and edge and then the near and the far zones are all contiguous. They can move gently from their own uh, secluded and private home into nature. Now, um, that is not always so easy. And uh, so we can see in this case, we've got uh, a much less um, easy connection. Um, uh, the design of the environment here, all the things that are responsibility of architects and urban designers is in fact squeezing out the access to nature. It's uh, the obstruction of the sensory um, link and the difficulty of the access link. Uh, three other things in, in, in my reviews of, of work struck me was the, the value of gardening, which again has terrific uh, implications for architecture and the sort of pl micro planning of communities. Various benefits there um, are claimed and proven in many cases. At um, attracting wildlife, we, the, the value of wildlife in our cities is very much taken granted but it has to get there and um, unless it can fly there it's very difficult for wildlife to travel across cities these green bridges uh, and conduits this is a bridge across Mile End Road not very far from here it's interesting that it was conceived to benefit uh, humans who are cycling or jogging or walking 
but really these green, bridge, green bridges could act as conduits for wildlife to bring it deep into the city. Um, other approaches at a more local scale is to generate wildlife parks and this can go on, be, this support can go on right down to building detail level. Um, it's commonly known now that our loss of garden birds is partly due to different styles of architectural detailing of eaves and various parts of the building. And finally, um, keeping pets. Uh, this is a very proven value, and yet how many architects really uh, think about how their planning will be conducive to keeping pets? Um, I don't suppose you expect to see beekeeping today as a subject, but there we have beekeeping within the site of the, uh, the gherkin. Um, right, well, sort of finally, to finish up then, uh, I propose this nature assessment, access assessment method, uh, really as either to be something that could be integrated with existing uh, sustainability um, assessment methods, which have enjoyed great use, um, uh, which in fact consists of a combination of uh, quantitative models and judgment. And the important thing is that here we have to um, balance um, advantages and disadvantages in a non-quantitative way. So it, it, it introduces a certain um, level of expert opinion, which of course can be fed by various um, POE studies, uh, um, and social surveys and so on. So it wouldn't be impossible to actually begin to balance the various advantages of, uh, for example, uh, a, a high quality nature uh, area being separated from the, the, resi the residential area by a certain length or distance of, of, of access. Those values are difficult things at the moment to place on. Is it, is it a quarter of a mile? Is it a, is it a half a mile? How, how, how far? Um, right. And the, the, so just to sum up then, that there is actually overwhelming in evidence that access to nature I, I, is beneficial. And um, we, we just seem to need to bring those, those factors together and to, as Kuhn was saying, um, Constimus was saying, uh, to interpret it in terms of uh, architectural solutions. Uh, I'm sure there are architectural solutions, and I feel that that should be part now of our architectural education, rather like um, fire prevention or, or, acoustic, or acoustics is. Okay, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.